my name is Marcus Tedesco, and I lead the engineering team at a startup called Brink. We're based here in Berlin. I've lived here since 2021, and I previously came here from sunny San Francisco. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to do a brief intro to graph database concepts. We'll talk about what graphs are, are good at. Uh, and then we'll use climate policy as an example use case and how we have used Neo4j to build our graph database. So what are graph databases? Um, graph databases, graphs in general, are basically uh, the, the main components of them are nodes, which represent entities, um, usually things like nouns, uh, any type of object, people, places, businesses, uh, policies, um, things like that. Uh, and they also have edges, which are also called relationships, depending on the type of database you use. And these are the connections between the nodes. Um, in Neo4j, they also have the concept of properties, which are basically key value pairs uh, that are stored on both objects, uh, the, like the nodes, and the edges as well. Uh, in graph databases, re relationships or edges have equal importance as nodes. And I like to think of graph databases something like in the middle between NoSQL databases and relational SQL databases. So they have relationships between entities like tables do with foreign keys. Um, and many graph databases also support uh, indexes for faster retrieval and constraints for import in enforcing schemas. But they are much more flexible like uh, a NoSQL database. Um, I think technically Neo4j is considered a NoSQL database, uh, but it has a, a few more properties that uh, allow it to be used similar to how a relational database would be used. Um, graph databases have a number of different query languages, uh, such as Cypher, Gremlin, and Sparkle. Neo4j uses the Cypher uh, query language. Let's do a little side-by-side -side of some of the properties of uh, graph databases versus relational databases. Uh, relational databases are much more established, whereas graph databases still um, have some maturing to do. Um, the community is much larger for, for graph databases uh, and has standardized the query language that's used with relational databases to use some dialect of, of SQL, whereas there's not one standard across uh, all types of graph databases. Um, in terms of scalability, uh, graphs are nice because they allow fast retrieval even as the database grows, as long as you're querying uh, connected data elements. Um, if, you're, if you're looking for um, random entities uh, throughout the whole database, um, depending on your query, that, that could be um, slower. But if the data is connected, it's, it's fairly fast. Um, and with the relational databases, as your data set grows, uh, depending on what type of query you're doing, you could face performance issues in joining multiple tables. And um, and then the last thing we're going to compare is the visualization. I, I think graph databases uh, out of the box provide some very interesting uh, visualization tools. Uh, relational databases can also be visualized, uh, but require plugins to be able to do so. Um, so what are the, some of the advantages of graph databases? Data modeling is very intuitive. The Most of the time when you draw uh, uh, or if you're, you're doing some type of data modeling on a new domain, um, you end up drawing a graph on, on a whiteboard or, uh, or such. And these are graphs. Um, so the, there's many cases where the, the real world 
is naturally modeled by a graph. They're also very flexible. Uh, it's easy to change and, and evolve your schema over time. They are very efficient in querying connected data. And uh, because graph algorithms work natively with graph databases, um, it's, there's some very interesting patterns that can be um, discovered that might be harder to do with uh, relational databases. So things like clustering, pathfinding, or community detection. Um, using these algorithms, you can also get real-time insights. So you could um, uh, do similarity uh, between nodes in real-time, um, which might be harder to do for classification with a, with a relational database. Um, we also use this, uh, we also use our graph database. Um, we query it via GraphQL, and we use that as our API layer. Um, and graphs just in general play very well with, with GraphQL since they were designed for graph databases. Um, and, and lastly, the, the data visualization and the fact that the, the data models themselves can be quite intuitive, can actually keep business and engineering teams in sync when talking about complex uh, business topics. What are some good use cases for graphs? Um, of course, knowledge graphs, it's in the name. Uh, social networks, which many people are aware of. Um, recommendation engines, especially real-time recommendation engines, can benefit from uh, graph databases. Um, in financial industries, fraud detection is a big use case for graphs, as well as supply chain management, transportation networks. We use it for law and regulation, which we'll show shortly, and uh, communication networks, as well as uh, things in the natural world like molecular structures, so chemistry and biology can, can be used as well. Um, what are some things to consider when when you are deciding whether a graph database is right for you. Um, data segregation does uh, get more difficult in a graph. Um, you need to decide whether you're logically or physically separating your data uh, and where in a relational uh, architect, re relational database architecture, uh, you may have um, either separate databases or tables uh, to, to physically separate your data. Um, doing so with a graph um, comes with some trade-offs. You, uh, in many cases, need to decide whether you're going to use one large interconnected graph or many small, um, essentially subgraphs or, or um, disconnected graphs. Um, you do lose some of the advantages of, of um, the graph algorithms when you separate them, um, but if that is a, a requirement for your data use case, um, you, you can separate them into smaller graphs. Um, access, access control is more difficult when all the data is in a single graph. Um, so whereas you might uh, restrict access to certain tables to uh, certain certain users or user types in a business uh, having everything in one graph does make it a bit more challenging there are some uh, role-based access control measures you can put in place um, but um, just the nature of the the connectivity between uh, entities in the graph means that access control is just a bit harder to manage. Um, another thing to consider is schema management as the graph gets bigger. Um, both one of the, the positive and negative things about having a very flexible schema means that um, you can change it and you can change it often and uh, keeping track of, of different versions of um, of your schema, how things are connected, what type of labels you use on the nodes and the relationships um, can get cumbersome. Um, one of my um, biggest pains 
right now is that there's no uh, concept of views in a graph database like Neo4j. Um, I find those very useful in, in relational database. So if you rely on those heavily, uh, it, graph databases or at least Neo4j uh, might not be the right solution for you. They do allow stored procedures, but um, not in their uh, hosted um, their hosted versions. Uh, graph databases uh, in general are just less mature, as we discussed briefly a minute ago. Um, there's just fewer tools, fewer integrations, less community support um, altogether. It's more of a, a more niche. Uh, there, there, there certainly are many tools out there, many integrations, and in, and there is community support. It's just not as robust as. Uh, as a relational database. So if you rely on those kinds of things heavily um, and want some out of the box features or plugins and, and such, um, those are gonna be fewer with graph databases. Um, but graph databases are excellent for many use cases, but they're not right for all use cases. Um, if, you are, if you're thinking about using a graph database, you may wanna consider a hybrid solution. Um, so you could potentially uh, keep uh, m most of your data where, where it currently resides, but if you want to uh, model the, the relationships between um, large sets of data, you could store certain amount, certain pieces of metadata in a graph and um, you know, update those you know, daily. You, you could keep them in sync uh, either with um, uh, with a, an event-based uh, architecture and do that in real time, or you could do batch jobs with an with ETL uh, jobs um, daily and, and find patterns um, on, on top of the data that you already have. Um, so now that we've gone over uh, graphs in general, I um, want to uh, briefly talk about our our use case at Brink. So um, Brink is a startup. Um, we are building tools for companies and, and private equity to basically understand how their business aligns with environmental and social sustainability goals of the EU. Um, so if you're um, from Germany and familiar with tax fix, tax fix, think about tax fix for companies for climate and social practices regulation. Um, we're focused on something called the sustainable, sustainable finance disclosure regulation, um, which has many different, many different parts. We're going to talk about, um, the EU taxonomy mostly today, but they also have something called principal adverse impacts and other, uh, many other, uh, forms of regulation that it references. Um, so why did we choose a graph database and why did we choose Neo4j? So, um, we, because we are working with climate regulation, um, we, we recognize that climate regulation is very complicated. It also is very interconnected, as we'll see shortly, and uh, it is also continually changing. So um, versioning the uh, different uh, kind of checkpoints of, of the regulation over time uh, is very important that we, we know who, which version you assess your business against. Um, we also are building a collaborative platform so that uh, companies and their investors can work together to assess their, their business. So uh, we take advantage of some of the social, uh, some of the same features of graph databases that social networks use. Um, also, Neo4j comes with GraphQL out of the box, which was super helpful for us. Um, unfortunately, that that is currently uh, a JavaScript implementation, but uh, still quite useful for rapidly um, prototyping new ideas uh, and, and trying out new data models. Um, we also needed flexibility when finding product market fit. Um, our business has, uh, in our our product has, has changed over time and we 
um, wanted to be able to quickly iterate on things um, without having to, for instance, migrate database schemas um, uh, all the time and, and things like that. This is also a greenfield project. Since we are a startup, we, we had the opportunity to build this however we found fit, so we didn't have any of the, um, the traditional kind of business uh, lock-in that um, some businesses might have. So uh, let's dive in. So we're going to do an example of uh, how we model the EU taxonomy in a graph. But first, we need to understand what the EU taxonomy is. So it's a classification system for establishing uh, a list of environmentally sustainable economic activities. So it came into existence as, existence as part of the European Green Deal. I, it is, the original version was a 349-page document that outlined 111 different economic activities that businesses uh, assess themselves by. Um, in the last few months, they've added six more activities, uh, just as an example of how this is, this is constantly changing. Um, they've released this, the regulation in several different formats. We just saw it as a, as a PDF. They've also released it as in this tabular form, format. Um, so you can see uh, the different activities, Oops. the different activities, um, descriptions about them, um, also what sector they're in, um, NACE codes, which are uh, a, a economic activity classification system that's used internationally. Um, and we will dive into this a little bit more. Um, so they also released this as an online tool called the EU Taxonomy Compass. Um, as we can see here, each activity falls into uh, a specific sector. Um, the activity has a name. And then also, the, these uh, six columns at the end are the primary objectives of the EU taxonomy. So um, these are objectives in which the activity can contribute to. So the main objective of mitigating climate change um, is, is the number one uh, objective. Uh, and then you can also assess your business against the rest of these. Uh, or access that specific activity against these objectives. Uh, as you can see, s these these plus signs uh, indicate that this is uh, this is an objective that this activity um, uh, contributes to. Some of these have uh, one, so these first three have one uh, have one uh, objective which is climate adaptation. And then we have uh, these down here that, are, uh, that have both mitigation and adaptation. So businesses can actually choose which one uh, or more that they assess their business against. So let's uh, click into one of these and, and see what this looks like. So, um, so we're looking at one of the economic activities that's manufacture of low carbon technologies for transport. So if we were whiteboarding this out, it might start out looking something like this. We have one activity, uh, manufacture of low carbon transport. Um, and then as we go down this list, we see that there's this primary, one of the primary objectives, so contributing to climate mitigation. Um, so again, if we were whiteboarding this, it might look like something like this. This activity has this objective. Um, and then we get into uh, this, this section, which is the description. Um, so this is actually a description of this activity as it relates to that specific objective. Now, when we try to model this, um, we, we don't necessarily want to put it on, uh, put that description on the objective because the objective is actually shared by many different activities. So in this case, what we do is we, we create a new node that has a description that's called uh, a match. Um, this, the term match is, is not unique to, it's not, it has nothing to do with graph databases, it's just what the EU taxonomy calls the combination of an activity and an objective, it's called a match. 
Um, so um, underneath of a specific objective, so in this case mitigation, there are two main categories of criteria that you assess your business against. One is called substantial contribution criteria and the other is called do no significant harm criteria. So the substantial contribution criteria basically um, is how you substantially contribute positively to the, the objective that you're assessing. So in this case, how does, how does your business when doing the activity of manufacture of low carbon trans technologies for transport, how does that positively uh, contribute to mitigation, the mitigation objective? Um, so if we model that out, uh, it might look something like this. So you've got this, this match, which is the combination of mitigation and the manufacture of transport activity, uh, and it has this criteria. And that criteria contributes to the, the objective. So the match and the, the substantial contribution criteria both have the same, uh, both have the same objective. Now let's keep going. Um, so if we if we drill into this substantial contribution criteria, we can see that there's a, several different clauses here, uh, and we. Uh, want to break this into more manageable parts so that we can assess our business by it. So what might that look like? We, we say this has a clause and then these clauses uh, may have sub clauses um, as, as these are, are lists and, and, and sub lists, nested lists. And they also re reference other pieces of regulation. So if we go back and, and look at uh, the, the previous slide, you can see that the regulation is referenced uh, in here, and some of these have sublists. So um, now we look at the do no significant harm criteria. Now these basically are the criteria that say, when doing your substantial contribution criteria toward the that main objective, you cannot harm any of the other objectives. So this is what uh, it looks like here. If we model this as a graph, it might look something like this, where uh, we have these two different types of criteria, and then we now are, we have these two blue objectives. Uh, one of them con is contributing to an objective, and the other one is saying it does not harm the other objectives. We also have clauses, and then we also can reference other, other things, like in this case, we're referencing an appendix. Um, but as you can see, the graph is growing, and we have lots of different types uh, of of nodes and different types of relationships here. Um, so what what would that maybe look like? Uh, this is basically um, an example of what our uh, graph for a single activity looks like in our database. So this is the actual query that I used to to find this. So we are just matching on on ac an activity type where the name of the activity is the manufacture of low carbon technologies for transport. Then we're finding the the matches. We are matching the criteria, and then we are looking for all the clause uh, children, which are these blue. Um, and uh, then we're getting all the references. So this is just what one specific activity looks like, and there are um, 107 activities, and then those all reference other regulations. And so the graph actually grows quite a bit. Um, this is the same, the same picture, but with some labels here. Um, so as you can see, um, the, the activity starts here and then we've got the, the matches on either side. And then on each one of those, the green node is the substantial contribution criteria. And then the red ones are all the do no significant harm. So we're saying this is the, the main objective. And then these are the, all the other objectives that you can't harm. And then they all have their clauses, which have to be individually assessed. And those on all the, all the yellow are referencing other regulation, which may also be referenced uh, by other activities. So um, how, do we, um, oops. so how do we use this in Python? Uh, Neo4j actually comes with a Python driver. Um, 
as you can see in this example, um, basically allows you to write cipher queries like we saw, um, but in in Python uh, strings, and then and then send those as transactions. Um, I actually prefer to use um, another package like this called NeoModel, um, which as you can see is doing the same thing, but it's much cleaner and much, in my opinion, much easier to read. So we can create structured nodes that have types um, and then we can create relationships between them uh, like, like this. So we've got a book type, an author type, and then the author has uh, a relationship or book rather has a relationship to an author and then on the other side authors have re relationships to books so uh, a book might only have one author but a, a, an author may have many books um, and then when if you wanted to create instances of each one of those you can you can do that like this you can save the nodes, um, give them names and vari or variable names in, in Python, and then you can actually say, okay, this is a, a book type, the, the book.author, uh, connect that to this author, and the Neo4j uh, Neo model package will automatically create the relationship between there with whatever the label is uh, specified in the, uh, the definition of the type. Um, now it's time for Q&A and I will see you live. So thank you for the interesting talk. We have some questions on Slido. So first question is, did you ever have an issue with so new Thank you for the interesting talk. Okay, so sorry. Did you ever have any issue with Neo4j only allowing for directed graph? We if, have some questions. So how did you solve it? Slido. So first question is, did you ever have an issue with so Neo4j? Thank you for the interesting talk. <laughs> okay, so sorry. Did you ever have any issue with Neo4j only allowing for directed graph? We have some questions. So how did you solve it? So first question is, did you ever have... Sorry. Is it working? <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, did you ever have any issue um, with Neo4j only allowing for directed graph? I can't hear or see anyone anymore, but you can hear me. I mean, for directed graphs. Okay, so what happened? Cannot hear anything. Why he cannot hear? Is it working? <laughs> Just stick the top ones. Yeah, what is the question? I can't write it. There are many. Is it working? Very Hello, Marcus. We can hear you. Okay. Uh, I will write down a question so to avoid uh, the echo. Okay, that works. Uh, did you ever have an issue with Neo4j only allowing for Slido? Um, Slido. No, uh, I'm. I'm. I'm not sure. I. I. If there's a follow-up to that question. Uh, I'd love to hear it, but I'll, I'll answer how I understand it. Um, it allows for directed and undirected relationships. So, um, in the example that I uh, that I posted, um, 
of that, that query. Um, you can either have, uh, you basically can have an arrow on, on either side of the relationship um, or no arrow at all, and it will find any relationship, whatever direction um, there, or you could have it bi-directional as well. So uh, there is flexibility there. So no, you don't, it doesn't have to be directed. It doesn't have to be undirected. It can be, every, every relationship is, is, uh, is independent. So you could have some that are directed and some undirected, um, unless you put constraints on it and force it to um, certain types of relationships to only be a certain way. Uh, how do you keep track of data quality in a graph? Um, that's a great question. I, uh, it's kind of one of the things that I um, um, was alluding to in my, um, in one of those bullet points about uh, data management. Um, I think that that's kind of an issue with every uh, every type of database and big company um, is data management. Um, you can add constraints, so you can say certain types of nodes are required to have certain properties, and you can't insert them into the database or um, or retrieve them without uh, those properties existing. So that's how you can kind of force to force the schema, um, but. Um, I think documentation and um, kind of having a team uh, that that understands the the importance of of data schema management um, is is uh, definitely it's not an easy thing to do, but it's it's definitely necessary. Um, did you look into Apache Age and why Neo is better than it? Uh, I did very briefly, um, but uh, Neo4j, I think, is probably the most used uh, and most, um, both in terms of just like number of companies and, and businesses using it, um, but they also are uh, a company and that will give full support. Um, so we actually, um, you know, as a startup, one one of the things I uh, try not to do is add extra work for our engineering team if we don't need it. So we use the managed uh, Neo4j solution from um, from Neo4j um, through GCP, um, which takes away some of the overhead there. And that's not that wasn't something that I could find with with uh, the Apache solution. Um, did you run a hybrid approach or your company as well? And do you make sure that, um, so right now we, we do use a hybrid approach in terms of like our data storage, uh, but not, uh, at the moment we we're not using something like a SQL database and a graph database. We're using um, things like cloud storage or or like S3 buckets, um, if you're familiar with, the, or if you're using AWS. Um, so that's where we do like object storage for files and things like that. And then we store the metadata about it or the references um, as an index in the database to say, this is the person who owns this file or this company owns it or what it's been um, attached to. Um, and then we also use um, some vector uh, um, embedding um, as well, like Elasticsearch um, for, for some of our machine learning stuff. So we do use a couple different solutions, but um, the side-by-side -side SQL and uh, graph we, we don't currently use. Um, if I were to... Um, it, it like if if you were gonna do something like I described in, in the talk um, where you had a SQL database and then you um, and then you wanted to get extra insights from it, I probably wouldn't. Um, I would I would start simple and do it as kind of like a batch of where you're you're putting updates in at regular intervals, but not relying on it as a real time system. Um, but if you, if it became something where you needed to make it a real time system, I would probably use um, like uh, um, an event based system and use change data capture um, on my SQL 
database and then put the the changes into the uh, the graph. Um, how do you version your graph? Um, that's a, a great question. Um, one of the, I, I, I kind of, I, I, I probably should have showed that as uh, you can, the, there's kind of like two, two levels. Like if you, um, if you were gonna like change the whole data schema, that would be like changing the actual version of your, your um, like your data model. Um, and to keep track of that, um, you would do it similarly to how you do it with like um, in SQL, where you probably have like some type of migration uh, scripts or some type of migration tooling that can run to kind of like replay the actions um, of changes you've made to your tables um, and, and migrating um, data into to new tables. So you can kind of have a list of those, um, but um, looks like we are out of time and I appreciate y'all coming. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, um, but thanks again.